Hi, I'm John Gilstrap, author of the Jonathan Grave Thriller series, and in this episode of A Writer's View, we're going to talk about what I think is one of the hardest concepts for new writers to understand, and that is the concept of voice. And we're going to get to narrative voice by way of point of view selections, which I think is one of the most important selection a writer can make when first setting out to uh, tell his story. The point of view chosen infects and affects everything that follows. So I hope that makes sense when we get to the end of this. I teach a seminar routinely called Adrenaline Rush, writing suspense fiction, and this turns out to be one of the uh, most appreciated sections that I teach. Now obviously in a video like this without the interaction with the audience is going to be a little bit different, but I wanted to touch on it anyway. So what is point of view? Well, we all know about first person, second person, third person, and what have you. First person, <clears throat> excuse me, first person is uh, the I. I did this, I did that. You know, telling the story from the, the point of view of the, the narrator. And the narrator is the same throughout the book. Uh, typically, you see a lot of... Um, First person narrative is very successful with detective fiction and with procedural crime fiction because the first person allows uh, the, the, the onion of the story or the plot onion to be peeled along for the reader at the same time that is being peeled by the, uh, by the protagonist. So that's what first person storytelling is. It's I did this and I did that. Now, there are strengths that I just talked about. It tends to work very well. It tends to be very personal uh, experience between the reader and, uh, and, and the writer. But there are two major weaknesses, I think, to the first person point of view, which is why I rarely write in it. I do it for some short stories, but I've never written a novel in first person. And here's why. You cannot present the bad guy's point of view without switching from the first person over to a third person, um, which I find very jarring. I think it's cheating. Uh, that's just me stylistically. I don't, I don't, I've never read a book. I shouldn't say never. That's probably too strong. I rarely read books where the author attempts that and pulls it off successfully. But the biggest weakness, again, I write thrillers. We talk about this pretty much every episode. I write thrillers and by writing first person past tense, the one thing we know as readers, the one thing we know is that the protagonist survives. So whatever danger he finds himself in, or that she finds herself in, uh, we know they're going to get out of because it's first person past tense. Okay, so those are the weaknesses for me, and as a thriller writer, that's why I just, I don't write in the first person. Um, Second person would be you did this and you did that. I just think that's a mistake. I'm not even going to talk about it. So what I am going to talk about for the most part is my favorite point of view, which is the third person. Now, third person is uh, most often used in thrillers or thrillers most often use third person. It's done in other genres as well. And I like the idea of being able to switch back and forth between the good guy's point of view and the bad guy's point of view because as a, thrillers are largely this big plot train wreck that is being set up and you have the forces of good coming against the forces of evil and then it, it ends up coming together uh, rather explosively in, in the third act. So I prefer the third person, but not all third person narrative is created equal. Um, for example, let's take the omniscient third person. Now, I will confess up front, I'm entirely self-taught, so I might actually get these definitions wrong, so we're going to discuss what they mean to me, all right? So the omniscient third person to me is all-knowing. It's perfect sight, um, but it tends to move characters around as chess pieces rather than actually getting involved deeply into any given character's point of view, and I think it's harder for the readers to bond. Um, take this as an example. I use this in, in my class. Um, suppose you're going to be writing about a chess game. The plot is, is the fight of the, the chess battle that's on the board. Well, the omniscient point of view would tell the, the chess player's viewpoint. Um, it would be looking down on the board and you'd see what the strategy would be and 
you know how how the game was was unfolding from from somebody's point of view other than the chess pieces now suppose you want to tell the story of a chessboard battle from the point of view of a pawn or of a bishop so whereas the chess player has a view of the entire board and knows how everything interacts, the pawn only sees this big sea of squares stretching out in front of him, and he just sits there until suddenly you know, a hand comes over the top of his head and then moves him out to out a couple of squares, and then he engages in battle with, with, with another pawn. That story actually I think would be kind of fun to write, uh, or it could be the bishop's point of view or the knight's point of view who has a squatty little guy standing in front of him that uh, once, once he steps out, it's like, oh, crap, now, now I'm exposed to danger. Now the knight is exposed to danger. So that is what I call the, the close-in third person or the third person uh, limited point of view. It's the difference between the omniscient, all-knowing, and taking on a particular personality or per particular set of eyes to unravel the story. The third person limited point of view tends to be very, very successful in thrillers. And I will tell you, meaning no insult to anybody, that's one of the reasons why so many journalists and lawyers have a hard time transitioning into fiction because they've spent their entire careers looking at the big picture and not really taking a side, at least not emotionally taking a side. But fiction is all about characters doing interesting things in interesting ways, and it's all about taking on the, the uh, character's point of view. The key to doing third-person limited characterization is what I call camera placement. And by camera placement, I mean your third-person point of view. Imagine that you are the camera in their head. So in your storytelling as the narrator, you can't talk about if 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 we're talking about I'm Charlie in 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 the um, uh, in in the book, and so we're talking about my point of view, and you can say what Charlie thinks and what Charlie feels and what Charlie sees, but you can't talk about what the guy next to Charlie is thinking because Charlie doesn't know. He can imagine what the other party is thinking, but he can't know that because his limited point of view is just that. It's his limited point of view. So now here's where the voice part comes in when we're talking about point of view. Um, the, even when narrating through the, uh, your characters, your, if, if Bob owns the scene, right? Your character Bob owns the scene, the narration flows through his voice as well. It does not flow for it to be effective. I think gospel according to Gilstrap, and you know there are no rules in fiction. I've said that a thousand times. But my rule is the writer, the author, John Gilstrap, in my book, should be invisible. The story is told through the points of view of the various characters. So in Nathan's Run, my first book, the protagonist was a 12-year-old. So his scenes are told with the worldview and the vocabulary of a 12-year-old. It's, it's much smaller words, it's less detailed descriptions, because that's how a child reveals the world. In the Grave series that I write now, uh, Jonathan Grave is largely involved in hostage rescues. So, you know, he kicks the door and he, and he shoots bad people and, 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 and saves the day. I don't want to downplay it. It's a, he's pretty good at what he does and he's entertaining in what he does. But the language I use in his scenes for his mission accomplishment is entirely different than the language I use from the, when I'm writing from the point of view of, say, the hostages or the bad guys, because their worldview is different. So um, let me see. I've got two examples here I want to read to you. I, I can't memorize it, so we're, we're going to read it. So consider these two examples. We're describing the same exact scene. The same action is occurring, but we're going to do it from two different points of view. Here's number one, and Bob is our character. Bob pushed the door open and climbed out into the brilliant sunshine. Shielding his eyes, he scanned the horizon. The beauty of the place took his breath away. Rock formations glistened in shades of copper, gold, and bronze. The vegetation, while sparse, seemed to vibrate with shades of red and blue and yellow. He was stranded in an artist's paradise. Now, I should have told you up front that this scene takes place in a desert. Maybe you, you got that from there. But I think what this language shows, without me 
telling you is that Bob is kind of an artsy guy. And uh, because of the language choices, and um, remember that whole show don't tell thing that you've heard a thousand times? This is part of it. Now consider this a different version of Bob in the desert, which quite honestly is much more reflective of my views of the desert than, than the other one. Opening the car door was like opening a blast furnace. Superheated air hit Bob with what felt like a physical blow. It took his breath away. The desiccated ground cracked under his feet as he stood. As he took in the scrub growth and the rocky horizon, he understood that he no longer rested at the top of the food chain. Now he understood why we tested nukes in places like this. All right, so here's an opportunity where we use the third person characterization by using his worldview, we're able to develop the character while at the same time describing the place. And that's the magic of, in a nutshell, that's the magic of effective fiction is we, we talk about character and setting and, and uh, plot and conflict and all that. We talk about these things as if they're separate when in actuality, it's just one great big tapestry of storytelling. So as, as you're describing your place, you're also developing the character and that's all done through voice. So um, if you're having problems with the flow of your book or your story, uh, if things just aren't adding up, if it doesn't have the emotional impact that you wished it would, consider altering your point of view. If you're used to writing in first person, try writing that scene in third person or, or vice versa. I will tell you an example from my own past, when I was writing at all costs, which was my second book uh, back in 1998, there's a really cool scene where I have a 13 year old boy named Travis who's being attacked by a, a hitman in a hospital. So Travis is tied to a bed and uh, you know, restrained and uh, the bad guy comes into the hospital through horrible means and tries to kill Travis. So I first wrote the scene from the bad guy's point of view because I wanted to show how diabolically clever he was. And it just didn't work. I was, you know, the action was there. It just didn't pay off. Well, then I changed it to the point of view of the 13 year old who's being attacked and can't move. Well, of course, that's a much more dramatic point of view. The story went to the same place, but it went there through a much more uh, emotional and, and effective means. So, um, you know, it, it's, this writing thing is a journey and it's a challenge and I, I wish you all the best with it. That's why I'm doing these videos. Um, if you'll allow me a moment of shameless self promotion, if uh, you're interested in me conducting this, uh, my, my seminar, if you belong to a writer's group or whatever, I don't actually have standing classes that people attend. I'm invited to go and attend them. Uh, check out my website, www.johngillstrap.com. And, um, I think it says hire John as a speaker and it, that will give you the logistics of how to go about doing that. Um, also, just here we got to do, uh, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. There's the button's going to be over here in a second. Uh, like me on Facebook, which is John Gilstrap author. The YouTube channel is author John Gilstrap. I didn't really think that through all that carefully. Follow me on Twitter. I am at John Gilstrap. But even if you don't do any of those things, y'all take care and please keep reading. I'm John Gilstrap.